So hi guys, uh, welcome back to the podcast Fence In. Um, this is your podcast uh, designed for fencers and athletes that are stuck in lockdown like the rest of the world and hopefully we can give you some training ideas and tips um, on how to stay in shape uh, whilst we're all in quarantine. Um, I'm here with Chris, who you probably know if you're a, if you're a listener. If you're someone that's tuning into the first episode, Chris, tell us a bit about yourself. I am a foil fencer from London who's currently quarantining in Suffolk. Uh, I've been to one World Cup and won a bronze medal at the Commonwealth Championships, which was amazing. And actually, you and I were on the same team when we won bronze at Team Nationals. Oh, we uh, did, yeah. Which, which was amazing, yeah. yeah. I found some old photos of that. That's when we uh, yeah, yeah, two, two, two clubs combined on that one. But it was, yeah, it was very good. We... Um, Oh god, that brings that brings back some memories. Um, yeah, so I, I, I that, yeah, that was a very very funny event. It was um, Chris and I uh, have have not actually spent much time on a team together actually. And for those that um, don't know our relationship, um, Chris and I are good friends, and we're also coaching a student. Um, so I've been coaching Chris now for a little while, and. Chris is a, a great student, and we are kind of discussing. Um, lots of different things from many different aspects. So sometimes I look at this from 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 an athlete to athlete point of view. So Chris and I talk as as athletes, and sometimes um, we look at this in how we how we do things from coach to student. And and today in episode four, we we bring you technical uh, training and footwork. Um, so this leads on quite nicely from the tactical training um, that that we spoke about last uh, last episode. Um, and so actually, this would be quite good to not only get our ideas and, and, and kind of knowledge um, and curiosity as two athletes who train heavily in, 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 in the technique uh, of the sport that is fencing, but also how we have worked together and, and we have tried to continuously build um, Chris's technique and, and things like that and how he's found that and how he's adapting to that kind of training. So. Chris, what, what, when, when the idea of talking about technical training, what, what's the first thing that kind of leaps to your mind? So for me, it's the first element of training that's kind of much more specific to fencing. So there's lots that we do at the moment that's uh, incorporated into kind of basic fitness and strength training and stuff that's meant to complement your fencing to help you go further. But technical work and training is source of the fencing in the absence of fencing you know it's doing your footwork it's hitting a pad it's holding a blade um i've actually started holding a blade in my left hand as well so i can simulate doing beat and uh, disengage uh which i you told me about um and i saw keith cook doing on youtube which i thought was brilliant i couldn't believe it it hadn't occurred to me earlier on and what about you there's probably something i've missed out but uh, what, what do you incorporate into technical work and training yeah, technical work, you can't, like, I mean, I keep saying this, this is my, my terrible strap line that I should really get out of the habit of doing, it's probably not helping the listeners. But again, technical work can be quite broad and it can be quite specific. I kind of see technical work as um, lessons um, where, you know, you're working quite heavily on blade technique. And the reason why we've kind of incorporated footwork into that is because footwork in itself is quite a technical element. And that obviously can be trained separately. Um, but the two are obviously intrinsically linked, which is another good phrase of mine, um, which is kind of the idea of having a lesson incorporates both blade work and footwork. And these are the two major elements that have to be refined um, to a high level in order to, to succeed in this sport. Um, one of the things, so Chris and I always send over notes to each other every week about kind of things we want to talk about. And um, one of the things that I've got on my list is I, I, I refer to as the show pony or the brawler. Um, and, and I suppose you've got, and, and like most people will see when they, when they watch fencing at a high level, you get somebody that looks classically very, very beautiful. They've got what most people would describe as very solid technique. And then you've got the kind of the barroom brawler, which is somebody that is more of a warrior, more of a fighter. The technique is not as refined. Um, there's more kind of just fight, um, and, and, a, and a willingness to hit. Yeah. And so I recently heard... Uh, another description of this which is kind of the creator and the destroyer yeah, so nice. on one side of the beast you've got somebody that's trying to make magic and then the other side, like i don't care what, I, what you're doing i'm just going to find a way through yeah yeah completely and actually what's what's great to see and what's not great to see 
is sometimes you get the uh, the beautiful athlete making gorgeous technical actions um, just get effectively bummed out by somebody who's a brawler, someone who's a fighter, someone that's able to manipulate their body um, with quite good timing, but it is more of a kind of fighter. And that's always heartbreaking to see sometimes because one of the things I love about fencing is the fact that it is such a creative sport with obviously a lot of logical realms around it. Um, and so someone that can take that logic, take that kind of um, structured approach to fencing, but also have their own flair on that is, and, and what is we probably described as their own individual technique, the uniqueness to their game. That's always sad when you see someone of, of such quality lose to someone that's more of a fighter. Having said that, you also get people that are, 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 are fighters that can be also quite aesthetically pleasing as well. Yeah, definitely. And that's also part of the skill, I think, is not needing to pull out all of your technique. If you can win fights and get by on being a destroyer or a brawler and you don't need to pull out all the stops, you can get by with kind of two or three things until you get to somebody that's a different style or different timing or kind of makes you have to change your game, then why would you change that? Yeah, no, completely. And, and then sometimes you get two people with gorgeous styles coming together that may know each other very well. This usually happens with teammate on teammate or country on country where they know each other so well, they have to pull out all kinds of different things to really throw the person off thinking outside of the box. And But then it is really lovely to see a more of a fighter be be, be hit with such gorgeous actions by um, you know someone with, with beautiful technique. I mean, Chris, is there anybody on the circuit, both internationally or nationally, that you think has got really gorgeous technique that you kind of like you, you emulate, you look towards, oh, you know, I'd love to look like that when I fence. Yeah, the first person that comes to mind is Rayson Burden, actually. Mm. Um, I think his control of distance and his technique are, are really brilliant. But actually, there are four fences I try and think of when uh, I'm fencing on, on what I'm trying to do. And you, you might think of it as trying to pull certain elements from, from various fences. And you come into this as well at some point, even though you're not one of the four I'm going to mention. Um, you know, you've got other <laughs> fences you kind of bear in mind at other times as well. So you, those four for me are Garozzo, Safin, in Bowden and Navador mm, um, and yeah. you can take something amazing from each one of those and it might be an arm position so for me in Bowden is kind of you know where the blade sits and control of distance Lavador is about being more point first uh, and led slightly more like that Garozzo is about the preparation you know the slow prep and high use of half steps and absence of blade and then Safin is about kind of high point and uh, his use of counterattacks as well, which are really amazing. And I know you always, in our lessons, you often refer to not necessarily these fences, but various fences and, and what they do and, and what uh, they're trying to achieve with it, which is really helpful because as somebody that only really gets to see these guys once a year at satellites, and not all of them, you know, you only get the ones that turn up. Um, but that's really helpful because I get only get to see them on YouTube. So being able to experience it not just in three dimensions, but also kind of fa you know face on, head to head, rather than side on, mm. is is really important. I think you get to see the whole package of somebody when when you know when when you see it live. And and um, I I was very very privileged to 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 be out at the um, uh, at Rio when when Danny Garozzo won gold, and and it was such a uh, an amazing display um, of what is probably quite modern technique. Um, you know, with this kind of absence of blade and this really controlled preparation, these very late finishes that we kind of we talk about. Um, but I, I would say probably one of my favourite fences of all time to watch always has to be Yuki Ota. I mean, the, the Japanese fencer that won um, that won silver at the uh, Olympic Games in in uh, Beijing, just narrowly losing to Clybrink in the final. Just such a very fast, dynamic, and precision athlete. He is absolutely amazing, and not only that, he was world champion three was, yes. years ago. He was, yeah, yeah, you're right. And actually retired relatively early. Yeah. Um, yeah, because he's quite young, which you and I learned the other day. Um, but I, I think what what's kind of interesting about when we talk about technical training is that, and, and again, in my notes, I've got devils in the detail, and which is the, the, uh, the idea of breaking down technique to the point where I remember one of my first coaches made me do everything really slowly. And I got so frustrated as a kid. Why are you making me do everything so slowly? And actually, as I got older, I'm realizing that this is just about trying to create the the, the, the neural pathways in, in the brain to really cement that action. So it becomes habitual, it becomes ingrained in, 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 the, in, in the mind. And, and actually, along with that, there, there's, um, there's a learning cycle. 
um, which is about, uh, and it, it's quite an interesting one. So you have um, unconscious incompetence. So you don't know what you're bad at or what you're doing wrong. Then you get comp- conscious in, uh, incompetence where you suddenly realize what you're doing wrong or what you need to do differently. Then you get conscious competence. So when you think about it, you can get it right. You can you really have to apply yourself to make sure you deliver that that action, that movement. And then you get unconscious competence, which is you don't think about it. You just deliver it. And that is the whole idea of this ingraining of technique from a very, very early age and really working hard to make it so it's second nature. And that's what you're trying to achieve, isn't it? So we've often had moments in lessons or in fights and I've heard you commentating on fights or you know seen you watch other people's matches as well and say that really what you're trying to achieve is focus on the moment focus on the preparation because really what you want is for the hit to just be there and not have to think about it when when you need it and also the actions are so fast Mm. you can't think about everything everything's have to be kind of done with intention or you kind of know where you're going or and if that's not the case you just have to trust your instincts to take over. You just, which is why focusing on the preparation is so important. You know, the half steps and the and maintaining distance and kind of forcing a distance that you know will work for a hit. Yeah, yeah, completely. And I think that, you know, when when you and I have lessons, and even when you and I have just been sitting in the stands and watching fences, or or we've been at a competition together, and you you see somebody doing something so beautifully when they're really in the moment and they're able to, they're, they're not stressed. And that kind of stuff. And then you start to see potential bad habits slip out as they get more stressed. And, and this is all the understanding of it constantly has to be refined and it constantly has to be ingrained into the body. Where actually we talk about stress responses, which is you often find that young athletes, when they're competing, can deliver the good technique, the good actions in, in the right way that they've been shown by the coach. But as they get more stressed and they feel the pressure, you start to see bad habits come out or old habits or incorrect movements. And so that's why psychology at quite a young age is important to help the, the student understand that even in their most stressful periods of fencing, they should still try to do the correct actions rather than things that they feel they can just get away with. You know, you often find that kind of when you look at the uh, the early series of, uh, of youngsters when they're fencing, it's often the one that's kind of hit puberty first, often wins the medal, right? Because they're the biggest, they're the strongest, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, if they're not coached properly on how to refine their technique, When everybody else catches up with them, it's about who's really been refining the good technique, the good discipline of actions done in the correct way that actually eventually comes out on top. And actually, this leads me on to a a book that I was going to talk about, which is is called Bounce. Chris, have you read Bounce? No, I haven't. What is Bounce? Um, So it's written by Matthew Syed, who was a former Great Britain uh, table tennis player that went to the Olympic Games. And for me, it's one part jigsaw, but it's an important jigsaw. And he talks about the idea of the 10,000 hour rule, which is you can only class yourself as in the world's elite or an elite person or a very high knowledgeable person in a certain field when you've achieved 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is roughly about 10 years. So for athletes that are starting out now and they're still trying to refine their technique, it's going to take a good 10 years for them to actually make that solid. How many hours do you think you've done? Oh, wow. Goodness me. Um, that's a, well, I started fencing when I was 10 and um, I'm going to be turning 30 this year. So I'm close to it. I know I'm, I'm not close to it. I'm way over it. But even if you think at the point that I started training properly, you know, like what I would refer to as like a young professional at 16, you know, that's still what, roughly 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that that's that's I, I think I've potentially done my hours. I've, I've clocked up my mileage. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting. I I wondered about this the other day, actually, for a completely different reason. And I try to work out how many hours I am on. I think it, it's so hard to know, though, isn't it? Because it's not all necessarily fencing specific. It's kind of how many hours have you put in geared towards fencing? So that could be runs and stuff as well, can't it? Oh, yeah, completely. And actually, you have to build up that, that those physical attributes as well. And sometimes young athletes or even top athletes, you know, still can find that for them, the reason why their bad com- habits come out is because they're not fit enough, and it's another aspect you you know you have to work on. So you know there there are, but then in line with that, you do also have many different teaching schools. You have many different ways of teaching. It's important for me to to just point out that I have been uh, my my first coach, Peter, who I mentioned last episode, w- was was a British coach, but I I have had uh, a, a few coaches in my career, but I've I've had 
two two Polish coaches and and one Russian coach. And there there are certainly I, I never like to say that one particular style suits one particular nation or that one nation has a set style per se. But I have been brought up with a in around you know Polish fencing and Polish uh, schools of thought. And, and so it, it's about understanding differences. And so you know we we look at the conventional what's say conventional more classical kind of leading with the point first foil based fencing but then you know you look at what Garozzo's doing from Italy which is lots of absence of blade and you kind of look at the teaching that happens in Italy and, and there's there's a lot more kind of distance play it's a lot more trying to trying to draw out the action or the reaction from somebody based on the, the footwork less so with the blade which would be more kind of you know what you would probably leading with the point would be I would say looking more towards, you know, classical French style of leading with the point, things that I got taught, obviously, through uh, both both Polish coaches and, and even, you know, one of the, the Russian coach that I was with, again, leading with that point. And so, you know, the conventions of foil mean that leading with the point was always meant to be seeing as the uh, the, the beginning of the attack, the the kind of the pro- taking of the priority. But as the modern era has moved forward, you're seeing that this kind of absence of blade is becoming more effective. And it's not, you know, not, not actually suiting one particular nation really, but it is meaning that there are different nations that do do things in slightly different ways. And so, you know, having trained in Italy for a few times and watching lessons, and this is all anecdotal from what I've seen, my experience not having had any formal training through an Italian system. But when you start to look at the way they do their lessons, it's a lot more foot led. It's a lot more feeling and finding the reaction based on the distance that you prepare at with with the feet. Whereas when you look at more of a conventional, say, French lesson, they lean more with the point towards the target first to kind of actually gather your distance or understand your distance more with the point led first, you know. And this is something I've always really enjoyed about your lessons. If you're trying to put across a concept or an idea or uh, you know, it's a new distance or timing that I'm not necessarily familiar with. And I've seen you do it with other students as well. It's not just me. You're a bit like a Rubik's Cube. You know, you don't hammer on with the the way of presenting it that doesn't work. You can quite happily turn the cube. Mm. And, you know, there's another way of saying the same thing or kind of presenting the same idea, which I find really, really helpful. And on the topic of different nations and doing different things, I think that's one of the things that's made the USA team and men's foil so difficult to deal with in the last few years is there are four key fences i mean actually there have been five of the last few years with the arrival of nick hickin but mm-hmm. you know when you had chamley watson in Bowden, massey Arles, and mindhart there are four fences there that have very different styles and mm-hmm. don't necessarily all use the same concept that mean that whoever's on the other side of the piece or whichever team is on the other end it really is on the receiving end because they might have an idea of what's coming but it's so hard to deal with you're not looking you're not dealing with the same thing every time and every hit. do you agree with that yeah, completely. I absolutely agree. And I wouldn't ever say there was a particularly, uh, and, you know, and as I say, none of this is founded on any particular teaching from any uh, nation that, that, that I've been at. I, I've, as I say, worked predominantly with with, a po- with two Polish coaches and, and obviously a Russian coach. So I can only comment on those specifically. But when you look at the USA, I would say that there, there is, there was a, there's a very unique teaching uh, at, the, at the Masialis Foundation where Alexander Masialis, who got silver at the, uh, the Olympic Games in, in Rio, he has, he has a particular style and, and the way they go about things. But each fencer on the American team is very different. And and of course it has to be because they're very different athletes. You look at Miles Chamley Watson, you know, he's very, very tall. You know, and you look at uh, Garrick, for example, Garrick Mindhart, you mentioned probably nowhere near as tall as, as, as Miles Chamley Watson, but at the same time, he's got unbelievably long arms. And, and so each of them are, are going to be, have different styles, different ways about going through things. You know, you say race, he's left-handed. So they're all unique in their own sense. So they've brought their own styles to the table, which is brilliant. And I think that the one thing I like, certainly the teaching that you and I go through, is the understanding that there shouldn't be one size that fits all. And you should take the athlete and help develop a a system or a style around them that they feel comfortable with, that suits their attributes as well. You know, you're not going to use like lots of closing in counterattacks with somebody that's, you know, six foot five. They, you know, you've only got to look at Richard Cruz. He's the king of a, of a stop hit. The man has dominated the, the international circuit by using his ability to find the perfect time to hit and get out the way. And, and, and you know, he can obviously do closing counterattack going forward as well. But, you know, you have the, this understanding that you have an athlete of this size and, and he's going to want to fence to his attributes. And, and so there are different schools of, of training. But at the same time, I think people should or any coaches out there should be very aware about 
the way they're coaching their student and also not try to stick to one particular way of doing things. I understand that you don't obviously want to confuse young students. I, I would completely agree. But at the same time, I think that you have to open up their mind to the possibility of lots of different things within fencing because it rounds their game. It means the ability for them to step foot on the piece and they can change their game accordingly or even have an understanding of other nations they they may meet. And actually, this brings me quite nicely onto kind of the, the next point, which is something that you and I have spoken about um, at length and something that you and I do in our lessons. But something I obviously feel I've, I've had both of these styles of lessons given to me throughout my career. And it's kind of the set piece versus the kind of open eye scenario. And so I, I think I was, I was always, I always grew up with coaches setting an exercise and there may be two or three different outcomes to that set exercise, but you knew what the set exercise was, whether that was an attack, whether that was defense, whether it was counter offensive, you would go in and be like, this is the exercise and these are three outcomes. But as I've got older, you know, that's repetition. That's great. And that's exactly what we're talking about through the 10,000 hour rule. Repeat, 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 repeat. But at the same time, I've also now I've, I'm working with both Pavel and Graham. Graham, uh, you know, actually said to me that, you know, you've, you've done a lot of set pieces for so long. You're very experienced. You need some more eyes open, which is the kind of uh, the idea, which is it's like fighting a Rubik's Cube. If you go back to your analogy, which is it constantly changes with very little instruction or guidance about how it may change, how it may develop. And so it's the idea of working on a feel. So then the idea of the lesson becomes very tactical. But I would assume, and from what I've seen, is that that starts to work better on an older, more experienced athlete who's got lots and lots and lots of fencing time on the piece that understands the game and how it changes and the feel of the game rather than just the robotic actions and, and the repetition aspects of the game, if you understand what I mean. And, and you know, Chris, when, when we've had lessons, do you find we, we kind of do more set paces, more open eyes, is it a bit of both? How, how do you find? I think there is definitely both. What you're talking about to me sounds like creative thinking and cool. the ability to kind of respond in a clever way with feeling. I know that in our lessons, we, we often start with a bit of both. You know, we kind of do feeling on the blade, we do feeling distance, kind of launching certain set pieces. When we first started working together, I know that actually you worked very hard, sometimes uh, frustratingly so, to put down new foundations or rebuild certain foundations with certain habits on, on kind of distance or, or hand positions and, and, you know, timing to go off, which at, at times felt very frustrating for me as well, because suddenly what was working in one lesson with a different coach wasn't working at all with you and there was very good reason for that and i i think it's probably very hard to think more creatively when you're in that position when you're when you're at that stage of relationship as you say then much later down the line we've now been working together i think for probably three or four years yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. we're in a much better position we know each other there's a relationship there we understand each other's timing and feeling and we can now get to a point where we don't necessarily always need a set exercise and set piece where we're trying to kind of improve technique but the idea is to to land us a you know a hit at a certain moment or certain distance or certain timing and i heard some commentary on a video a few weeks ago i think by sam wellis that said you know you've got to learn to love the infighting you know mm. and you know your technical hits in a lesson will be about kind of creating moments and kind of be, being able to put a point on at any moment. But the number of scenarios where they come up aren't always the case. You know, they might be kind of 60% of the time, they're not there. And so 60% of the time, you've got to be able to kind of just adjust and get a light on at a certain distance that might be wrong or kind of not feel right or, you know, making the most of somebody that's going to miss an attack. Because again, in, in a lesson, one of two things happens. A coach either falls short intentionally or they don't and they try and come through. But that mm. that doesn't necessarily replicate to a fight so in what you're talking about like i said earlier the idea of getting the preparation right is been very prevalent uh, with us and we try and set that up or rather you try and make me set that up with the use of a of a half step faint you know kind of on the front foot or a change in line on the blade so having that gives me time to assess what's going to happen or kind of you know instinctively know where to go and gauge the distance you know if at a certain distance we know you go in and try and hit. If you're a bit further back, then that half step needs to become half step, step lunge or half step lunge. And, but that half step gives you time rather than kind of having to, 
to rush or kind of be a bit more static, especially with a changing game and how it's refereed now. As you said, there, there's more prevalence given to the footwork and the way things are going because the footwork dictates a gap and therefore you can be hit in preparation. Whereas a few years ago, things were a bit looser and on movement, you could you could carry forwards and attack much longer. Yeah, completely. And I, 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 I agree. And I think, you know, you, you, you've looked at it obviously very, very technically there. And, and, you know, we do our lessons for sure there. there. There's the idea of getting the preparation right. And actually by getting the preparation of the action right, you hope that your instincts then take over and, and form the kind of correct outcome that you need. But without doing the correct preparation first, you're kind of con- uh, in conscious. Sorry, I'm trying to remember the words now. But the, the kind of the preparation, then when you allow your your body just to take over and make that finish, make that that kind of felt touch, you know, when the unconscious is just allowing your body to, to deliver that final action. If you don't get the, the foundations of, of the preparation and, and the beginning of the action right, then it's very hard to allow yourself to take over. You know, we, we kind of talk about this this idea, as you said, of when we first started working together, it was potentially undoing some things that we could make better. But now we know each other a lot better. There's a lot more understanding of timing. We can start to really pinpoint things for improvement as well as having that creativity still. And I found that with Graham. And one of the things that, that we did that he pinpointed, not only was the kind of, we need to make all of our lessons more openized, challenge your kind of thinking there and then, rather than just going through set pieces and kind of knowing the outcomes and, and, and just refining the repetition. He, you know, he said, okay, well, let's do everything open eyes, but then let's really work on your defense. And it was trying to get the footwork right in defense. He watched me for years as a friend. And it was the understanding that actually my defensive action or the reason why it wasn't as good is because my footwork wasn't correct in my defense. And so it felt my defense was very hit and miss. And to me personally, it it felt very hit and miss until I started to understand the timing of the action of the footwork to get that right, to be able to set the actions up. And I suddenly felt a lot more confident and comfortable in defense and soaking up those attacks. But it took a long time. And it also meant that my technical work was not only I, I was wasn't just analyzing it myself. My coach had able to see it, acknowledge parts that needed improving, and then bring his thoughts to the game. And I think that's what's really important when we talk about tactical training: is that your coach should also have the input of watching you, analyzing your fencing, and seeing where there are things you can improve on, and guide you through the lessons and guide you through your technical training about where you can improve on based on what they have seen as well as what you're feeling. And so, you've mentioned that you have two coaches. I do, yeah. yeah. How does Pavel's work feed in with Graham's work? So you mentioned that Graham is more open eyes. Is Pavel more set pieces, or is there a good blend of both? Well, the great thing is, is that that Pavel and, and, and Graham know each other well. Um, so when, back when Pavel was an athlete, he was coached by a guy called Lukash, um, and uh, Graham and Lukash uh, know each other very well. Done a lot of work together, and so it was almost uh, that you know a little kind of like fencing family. They knew each other really well, and, that, and they were they were very close. And so there's some similar ideas, similar schools of thought there. Um, you know, Graham's trained in Poland, and so he has, has the kind of understanding of some of the the, the the schools of thought over there. And what I love is that that Graham's a right-handed coach, and Pavel's left-handed coach. Even though they can both do the opposite hand very well, I, I love that I get that kind of balance of both. Yeah, I think with Pavel, they're, they're, he will he will deliver some set pieces, but there will be some some open eyes actions as well. And and you know both the coaches are very analytical. They've watched my fights. They're able to see from the outside about where I'm going wrong, both ta- tactically and technically. One of the things that I'm 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 certainly like working on. I have been with Pavel is the understanding that I I was falling short on a lot of my step lunges because I wasn't generating enough power from the back leg purely because the back leg wasn't in the right place at the right time. And so he was able to help refine my technique to make sure that I got that back leg in the right place at the right time to relaunch my attacks. And suddenly, you know, it, but what people have to understand is this took not only a, a little while to work that out, but it also took six months to a year to make it feel even remotely natural to the point where I can then start delivering that at a high level. And for me, having two coaches can be very complimentary for some people it might not work but you have to manage those relationships and you have to hopefully communicate with both of them so that you can get the best outcome so that's very interesting and there's a lot of detail in there that i think is really good so how is that work and technical work translating to what you're doing at the moment what kind of technical work are you doing at the moment in lockdown 
effectively by yourself. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, we've talked, talked, spoken a lot about technical work, haven't we? But I think people are, are, are struggling with technical work at the moment. It's very easy right now to go out for runs and stuff like that because we've all, you know, we can all go running. We can all do a bit of physical work, but technical work is hard. At the moment, like I mentioned in episode one, actually, I've got my very scary dummy that sits on the balcony that I beat up a daily. And, you know, just I try not to leave it in the in, in the bedroom in the middle of the night because it scares the hell out of me if I if I wake up. But the um, yeah, my, my, my dummy is proving very useful. And I think what what a couple of things that I've done is I've managed to attach a blade to it so I can do blade actions off the dummy. The other thing that I've done now is I've actually hung a uh, tennis ball in front of him so I can start doing little actions on tennis ball, whether that's beat attacks, whether that's, you know, kind of disengaging actions, even just a sense of timing using it like a pendulum. And I'm, for those that follow me on Instagram or on Facebook would have probably seen those stories and, and that I, I've done with the tennis ball. And, and it's, again, a bit of hand-eye coordination. You can do that with, with footwork, with kind of bouncing the ball and, and try to catch the ball on a lunge or even a step lunge and things like that. Again, what fencing is, hand-eye coordination. So with the dummy, I, I'm people ask, you know, what the hell are you doing? And I suppose... For me, I know what I'm working on. I know what I want to work on. And, and, and I'm trying to get that, that footwork action right on, on, on the dummy. But I'm also trying to be creative. I'm trying to think of new things to do with this dummy. The great thing is I've got a blade on it. So I, I can practice my actions. I can practice my engagements, my envelopments, my beats. You know, I, and I actually, the arm is maneuverable. So I can move it from uh, cease line across the car. I can actually take it into low line as well. So I can practice beats in every section um i can practice evasions you know faint disengages cutovers you name it and so i can really refine that but i have to be very self-critical i have to go out there and i have to be disciplined because every fence just likes to hit something but like i spoke about with the, the bounce book that i read they talk talk about purposeful practice so the ten thousand hour rule has to be purposeful practice you can't just sit there and go yeah i'm just going outside and flick the dummy for half an hour and then i'll i'll, I'll be done it's about really engaging yourself and really putting your focus down on what you're trying to achieve in that session. And so half an hour of focus work, and that's actually really challenging. And sitting there for, you know, 10 minutes just hitting or making beat lunge just to really refine the action, making sure there's a crisp beat, you know, there's good power in the lunge, the hand delivers first, all that kind of stuff can actually be, be quite draining on the mind to just work on that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I found something similar, actually. I'm finding at the moment I need to try and change up what I'm trying to achieve with technical work on a weekly basis to stop myself from getting bored. But what I've been trying to achieve this week are going arm first. So oh, yeah. ex extending purely with the arm uh, and not using too much shoulder or ideally kind of not really using any shoulder. Focusing on forearm strength, which I do through some technical work as well and kind of keeping it fun but though those are kind of my my two big things so i did have a very sad looking dummy which is basically a jacket with a pillow <laughs> on top of a, a shoulder bag which didn't work very well it was the wrong height it was it was face on it, mate. That'll make it a yeah, yeah on my fie kit that'd be great <laughs> <laughs> um i suppose i wear a lame so no one can see it yeah that's true but what i've got now is in the garage i've we've got you know a, a big old piece of mdf at the back of the garage and we've got loads of really old carpet um, and what I've done is just folded some of that old carpet over kind of two or three times. Nice. So it's a bit padded. Put that over the MDF and that's kind of effectively my wall target. It's it's not quite high enough, but it's it's good enough to practice different lines and kind of rolling the hand, you know, rather than using forearm, like working on a bit. And sometimes I, you know, I stand on guard and it's to my right. So effectively kind of acting a bit like a flank on a right hand defensive for me because I'm right handed, yeah, nice. you know, and I do try and do 50 flicks over effectively kind of cease flicks which i know i struggle with and trying to build some strength in that again with then alternating that with tennis racket you know ball on the wall so kind of doing really short volleys uh, forearm back arm and then kind of alternating those back and forth just to build up in an area i know i've struggled with and i, I probably won't get this chance again unless i forcibly remove myself from fencing for a while <laughs> to to really build up that strength and i'm finding that to be to be really helpful that's one of the places i am feeling the burn i'm not necessarily feeling the burn in other parts of my body but i am there which tells me that i'm reaching that muscle fatigue that i need in order to you know to grow and, and make improvements and muscle memory for that matter Actually, and muscle memory those, yeah definitely fibers to, to you know so it becomes completely uh, subconscious and natural just deliver those touches whether you're in a high press situation or not yeah, absolutely. And actually, the other thing is to do with, you know, we've spoken how sometimes I'm a bit lazy is the wrong word, but kind of a bit delayed on my recovery from a lunge. 
Um, you know, I'm not always as in and out as I should be. I'm really trying to work on that. So, you know, make sure kind of go in, hit the target in the right place and then get out of there as quickly as possible, really bounce back off that front foot. But the arm is going so far ahead that you've already landed at that stage. And as you say, you know, I could just do 100 lunges, but that wouldn't be the same as as kind of focused training in that regard and knowing what I'm trying to achieve. Yeah, completely. And I think that, you know, that's it in lockdown right now, as you can still do technical work. That's the important thing here. You know, whether, you know, it's just taking a blade and as you say, making a bit of carpet just so you, you can hit it. And, and even if it's just simple actions, just like, you know, getting the extension right or, or getting the uh, hand fractionally before the feet or actually doing the complete opposite, having a different school of thought, which is leading with the feet first invite the, the kind of reaction and then deliver the, the, the hand last minute, kind of your idea of your broken time, your absence of blade. It doesn't matter what you want to train technically as long as you're finding a way to do that. And, you know, to even if it's just a bit of carpet hung over, you know, your stairway or, or, or whatever, you know, a swinging ball that you can kind of aim for. All of these things will help do and refine your current technique. And like we said last week, look at your tactics, look at your, go back to your videos, have a look at yourself. What are you doing wrong? What are you doing right? Identify areas to work on. And then you can put it into your technical training because there's no point going and doing a technical session if you're not engaging and being focused and actually doing your purposeful practice like we speak about. But actually, you know, we, we, we've, we've spoken a lot about kind of what we're doing from almost like a, a, a blade action point of view. But we, we mentioned that this is about footwork as well. And I think that what we're seeing in, in, in modern day foil is that the game is so fast. It, the game is so unbelievably athletic these days is that people have this idea of kind of open eyes actions or kind of absence of blade. It, you know, this modern era has come about in foil where if you went to do a faint disengage open eyes, I guarantee you would be parried off the face of the planet because ultimately people are too fast, too athletic these days to just deliver any basically open eyes actions with the blade and so the idea of actually delivering your action with a hundred percent conviction you know for example you look at the way richard cruz floats down the piece and is able to hit anybody with this his amazing one two action people think oh well hang on a minute you know he does that and uh, is it eyes open no it's not eyes open it's completely predetermined he knows exactly what he's going to do but he delivers it so well he forces his opponent into actually making that uh, that that action the parry that he wants so that he can go around but the thing is if an athlete is disciplined enough to be able to not fall for the, the fate and take a different line he does get parried and and that is the point of fencing now which is most of the explosive actions you see are predetermined they're not open eyes the more open eye stuff you're seeing now is with absence of blade but even then the absence of blade is to try and draw somebody in to either counterattacking or trying to parry too early, it's not waiting for a response. Because when you're marching down the piece and you're waiting, 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 if the other person lunges into you, your reaction to that is too late and most referees will call it on preparation. Athletes that are doing absence of blade are really controlling the preparation and are waiting for the micro, micro twitch from the other athlete to immediately deliver what they want to, to deliver because then it will be in time. But they're forcing the distance with their body to get a rough idea of what the person is doing. They're forcing that person into making a counterattack. And the minute they feel at the appropriate distance where that person wants to bite at the counterattack, that's when they deliver their final action. Or if the person is really searching for the blade, they keep pushing this with the blade away. And the minute that athlete twitches on the hand, they deliver that kind of disengaged finish. And so it's the understanding that open eye stuff is not completely open eyes even then it still has constructs of what the athlete wants to do on the finish because if they're waiting completely open eyes if they're waiting for a response of any kind they will be hit on preparation 90 percent of the time if they have a very good idea of what the athlete other athlete's going to do then when they see that in a very 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 split second that's when they can do the action it's understanding shapes and you see the, the world's top athletes are their brains are absolutely honed in to different body shapes and body positions. It's like when you see tennis, for example, how can people return a ball that's come over the net at 120 miles an hour? They don't. They already know where the ball's going to go on the toss. So this is the idea of Garozzo pushing down the piece, pushing down the piece. And the minute somebody does a smallest micro twitch, he knows exactly where he's going to finish. But that's still in the realms of he may have two outcomes of where he wants to go, not 15 
like most people would assume open eyes would actually be. And so he knows where the other person is going to go. And the minute they show any body shape of that, he's able to deliver. And that's why he lands it on time. But that is done because his footwork is absolutely disciplined. He's able to sit down and work extremely hard. And this is the difference now at World Cup level and international level is that athletes are prepared to go long periods of time being very disciplined on the legs. And actually footwork now is a disciplined game. If you do jump in out of time, if you do try and finish your action too early, you will get hit. And that's why footwork right now is one of the most important parts of fencing because of the athleticism, because of the strength and power that now goes into it. And actually with the absence of blade, a lot of the control now on the finish comes from the legs. I'm not saying the footwork is never important, but possibly even more so than it ever has been before. And so that's why I refer to footwork is the discipline game. It's about doing those lengths, getting on the piece and doing purposeful footwork drills to make your legs strong and to mean that you can keep going and keep soaking up those actions until it's the right time to deliver your action. Yeah, absolutely. That's really interesting. And leads us nicely, I think, into a new section that we're including, which we're going to call us call and ask us anything, where just to get people more involved, to get our listeners more involved on how they can improve their time in lockdown and their training and 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 keep training keep going and and get some new ideas so i think you you got one from liam harrington yeah i have actually so um liam he's the the former chair of the the, the british um, academy and he he's a uh, he, he's actually a coach at um at defense club london as well and, and he asked, what actions do you find to be generally the most useful? For example, first intention, second intention, simple attacks, compound attacks, etc. So I think, you know, what Liam is getting at there is, is, is basically what, what is, you know, the, the actions that are most commonly used in, in, in fencing at potentially high level. Um, and I think the, the answer at the moment is, like we spoke about, is there's a lot of um, kind of absence of blade going on at the moment. However, my, my kind of answer is ultimately... Keeping things simple is, or, and I, I say this a lot, is the most important thing. I think simple attacks, um, obviously done very, very well to a very high level, um, will, will always catch people by surprise. I think the difference is what you often find with top level is they'll deliver a complex action. So a kind of absence of blade marching forward and then after doing a few of those, they'll suddenly deliver a very rapid, simple action. And so I, I would say ultimately what's being used now is in, in modern day foil is that it's a lot of attacking is going on. And so the attacking game is this kind of marching absence of blade. What, what most would describe as kind of second intention. So drawing out the counter attack or the parry. And then after that, I would say there's loads of very fast, very dynamic, simple actions that are, that are being used as well. W- would you agree, Chris? I do agree. And lots of the actions that you see are simple actions and they're, you know, you don't see lots of the flashy hits at high level. And it's certainly not for scoring lots of points. You know, if you look at or, you know, if somebody wins a match with lots of those hits, those hits, I think that's kind of the exception to the rule because, you know, they are often kind of just attack, beat attack, disengage, pair of boss, done at the right distance. It's all about the distance and driving the point on with the high percentage hits rather than the low percentage hits. You know, even the best flick is not a 10 out of 10 hit. Mm-hmm. I agree completely. And actually, you know, you, you, you say that. I think young athletes need to understand that the stuff that they see on Instagram and, and YouTube and, and Facebook and whatever, you, you see these awesome hits that are really complex, really compound, or even just what we refer to as flashy. But they're the ones that are highlighted because they look cool and they make great TV and, and great for the cameras, which fencing obviously needs more media exposure. But when you're at a World Cup, when you're a World Champs, European Champs, you know, you do see some of the, the most simple actions done effectively at the right distance and, and the right timing are the ones that are often used. And as I say, I think top athletes flip between kind of the second intention stuff and then, then, then simple based actions. And foil is more of an attacking game now. So I think that kind of answers that question. I've actually got two from a fencer I know in Norfolk called okay. Michael Knowles. Um, he's ranked in the top 100. His first question is, how do you apply athleticism to help win matches, especially when against someone less fit or mobile? I think that's a really interesting question. And I think absolutely depends on where your strengths are and where you know they are. So you know, one of the obvious solutions on having great athleticism 
is it might be to move somebody up and down the piece more to kind of work the moment. So as obviously when the other person's more tired, then those moments will present themselves more naturally. But on the flip side, depending on who you're up against, one of the things that you can do is to kind of use your additional strength, you know, kind of bully the distance much earlier on and kind of plow your way through almost or kind of use, you know, use your A game hit to get through. And if that doesn't work, then, you know, then use the piece uh, to to find another solution. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, no, I I, I think that it's it's important to to when you are very fit and when you are more mobile than somebody, I, I just use the mobility, use the ability to move in and out of distance fast. Use your fitness to be able to you know do length after length after length of of of, of piece because. If you can push someone and then soak up the distance, push them again, soak up the distance, they're getting exhausted by this point. When they're exhausted, they've got high levels of stress response. They feel the pressure more. They're likely to, to not be thinking uh, as, as clearly as they could. And then they will ultimately just deliver poor actions. So it, it's it's a, almost use the fitness as a form of patience. Use it as the kind of do length after length after length. And you're still fresh. Your mind's still thinking clearly. And actually, the options will present themselves because the other person is so fatigued that almost throw themselves into a position where you can then make ease of the hit. So use the fitness and the mobility as almost a form of patience. Keep drilling it, keep drilling it. And when they're exhausted, then the opportunities will present themselves. Yeah, definitely. And actually, on the topic of fitness, fitness doesn't always come from where you think it does. A few years ago, this was in Norfolk, actually, I did a, a park run of 5K and I hadn't been running 5Ks at all. I'd, I'd spent time in the gym doing my explosive work, um, you know, so my squats and deadlifts and, and whatnot and everything that goes with it. But I hadn't done any running at all in ages. And I think I came seventh of like 150 with a nice. time of, I think it was like 21 minutes and three seconds or something, which really surprised me considering I'd done no training for it. So, you, you know, kind of fitness does come from the other work that you do i mean that's not to say i wouldn't have gone quicker if i'd been doing more 5ks but i i really thought i kind of i get really competitive and my entire objective the whole time is to stay ahead of this like 11 year old that was running on willpower alone <laughs> and i think he came eight and i only overtook him in the last like 300 meters but it it comes it does come naturally you put the work in it will be there so make the most of it yeah. and michael's second question is quite interesting because I think it ties into what you were talking about earlier. When doing a marching attack or a progressive attack, are you waiting for an opening to score a touch or are you looking to create an opening? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that um, I, when I say you're, you're waiting for an opening, I'm very cautious about saying that because ultimately if you're waiting too much and you're the person's experience, they have an understa a good understanding of timing and distance, they will be able to hit you on preparation, especially the way things are being refereed these days. However, if you know, for example, that the athlete you're fencing against will eventually counterattack and you're looking to score to flank. So, you know, they're going to try and hit and block in cart lines so you can you can finish the flank One that marching attack that you are waiting for that opening. You are waiting for, for, for that opening to, to become available, but you're not waiting to for that for that opening to suddenly appear. What you're actually waiting for is the immediate first sign that they start to counterattack because that by that point you have to start your finish and as they then hit you and try to block out that's when you're already changing lines hit the flanks so you're scoring on time and so it's very important that actually there are some times you are absolutely uh, looking for that opening but you know what opening that already is with the idea of creating an opening you can have that absence of blade in a certain line in a certain way to force or hopefully force your opponent into making an action to create the option that you want. So you may know that a person will do X, but actually against another fencer, you may not know what they do. And so you try, should try to get some understanding of what you want to do on the piece just by doing you know lots of blade actions and lengths with them. But if you want to create an option or an opening, then you can sell different things. So is it that you carry your hand in cart line quite high as though you're looking to come down and, and put a flick on the back? And as they try and close distance, you drop the point short on the chest. All the things like this. But that's, again, that's a, a creating an opening by the way you present the preparation. And so it's very important that if you know what they're going to do, you're kind of waiting for that moment. But if you want to create an option, 
show them where you hope you want them to go and then you're able to go for the option that that you've created if you understand if, if that makes any sense yeah definitely but the key i think in this is to not be too passive about it because when you when you prepare in a certain line or a certain way like you said earlier you need to be able to commit to it to get the reaction that you're looking for it's all about recognition isn't it you're looking for a, a moment or a distance or a line that you recognize which is an opportunity to to go through and the pressure um, has to be it has to be there it can't be softly softly you know you have to look like you're delivering an attacking action at the end otherwise if you're just literally creeping forward referees will call preparation more these days since 2016 thing referees are getting tighter yeah amazing uh, definitely was there was there one more question at all uh, there was actually from from Chris Lennon, who's a club mate of mine at South Boston. He's an FIE referee and Pentas for Ireland. But I think we may have covered it earlier yeah, on in the did. episode. So um, it, to make it real clear, that was a, what are you guys doing specifically in terms of uh, drill hitting, drills hitting the pad and footwork? It can be it can be uh, stale just doing the same stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what I would say to that is, you know, set yourself up a dummy. And, and, and if you've got any footage in yourself, look back, see what you want to improve on, but also use as an opportunity to be creative. Look at other athletes, see what they do on the piece and then start to refine those technical actions on the dummy or, again, footwork drills outside. I mean, the weather's gorgeous at the moment. And so you might as well get out there and see if you can do some drills. Um, you know, look at the way the footwork is prepared with people that do do absence of blade, people that do push the the action with their feet. How are they setting that up with the with the legs don't only look at the blade action because the blade action might not be it might be one part of the jigsaw a lot of it could come from the feet and the timing and the distance of that and actually can you train the footwork can you train the hand and then can you bring both of those together and that in itself is tricky but you know it is trial and error sometimes yeah absolutely and i something else on that front is maybe have a few ideas you know have have five different ideas of things you want to do and maybe use one or only two of those in a single session so something I've been doing, for example, I, I know I mentioned originally trying to get my hand out very early at uh, different distances, you know, kind of short distance. So uh, without, you know, arm only, one with step and then one with lunge. But also if you're trying to work on fitness a bit, do five lunges against your pad or whatever, you're doing, or not even against your pad if you don't have one, but five lunges retreat, you know, by the length of about half a piece or longer if you've got more space and then back to the pad and do five more lunges and then back and forth and back and forth, you know, and do, you can do kind of three or five sets of that. And that's, that's really helpful because it's probably not until you get to set three that you're really starting to feel a bit tired with it. And as we mentioned before, it's not until you get tired that you really start to learn or kind of make improvements, I think, or, or correct, you know, kind of bad habits. So just make sure that when you get to that point, you, you make sure to do it right. But like you said as well, you can film yourself doing that and then you can critique critique yourself and you can vary the preparation, the steps leading up to that lunch. Even if you've only got a lunching pad, you can still, you know, vary the, the speed, the timing, the, the, the acceleration, the deceleration, uh, the tempo of the feet in order to get to the position where you do want to execute that lunch. But these are all things you can film, look back and go, well, that was good. That wasn't so good. Let's refine that more. And, and, and that is effectively what is being a top athlete. And right now we have time to critique ourselves, to refine technical work because we have a lot more time for ourselves now so um yeah i think i think that answers all, all those questions and, and guys please do get in touch you know we really like to hear from you guys that actually i think brings us nicely onto um you know the kind of the, the conclusion of this one which is you know technical uh, training and football training can still be done in lockdown i think we've given you quite a lot of understanding about the way things are being refereed kind of current modern techniques the way things are being used Get out there, get yourself a pad, um, do some footwork drills and combine everything together. This is a great time to be doing this to get yourself ready for the, for the new season, whenever it may actually happen. Uh, and actually, episode five, which we're, we're going to be recording next week, is, is on our mobility, stability and flexibility. So this is, this is something that we're going to talk about next week, the understanding that actually that's a really good foundation. But if you do want to get in contact with us, uh, do that via Twitter. We've got the at Fenced In pod podcast, so send, send us a, 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 an email. Or if you know Chris or I personally, drop us a message. For those that want to follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I am Ben Peggs. So you can drop me a message uh, personally as well. And please subscribe and review on, on, on Apple Podcasts and, and Spotify. I think that, have I got that right, Chris? Have I nailed that bit? Have I done that bit all right? 
Yeah, you've done that very well. We've actually, we're on uh, a number of additional platforms now as well. Google Podcasts, tune in. And when I look at the analytics feeds, there are a bunch on there I've never heard of, but that people are listening on. So that's great. Whatever you use to listen to your podcast or listen to us, keep doing it and spread the word. Correct. Chris is the tech man. He's looking after all that kind of stuff. So uh, get subscribing, get reviewing and get in contact, guys. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week. See you later.